Um, I'm Judy Alden for, for those, oh, unmute, wait, oh, I'm on, okay, am I muted? Everyone can hear me okay? I'm trying out a new mic, I wanna be sure, thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, which is a couple new folks I'm happy to see, I'm Judy Alden, currently president of HLAADC chapter. Um, today's program on young people and hearing loss, uh, I know we're all very much look for, looking forward to before proceeding to our program, though, um, let's go over a couple, couple important announcements. One, I'm assuming by now we're all zoomed out pretty much, so everyone knows how to use Zoom. Um, or just a reminder to click on the closed caption CC if you do want to see captions, which are provided by a very talented captionist, Natalie. This is CART, real-time captioning. Um, click on mute, please, unless you're talking so we don't hear your your beloved dog in the background or whatever. In my case, my grandson who's upstairs. Um, and if you have questions you know, in the moment, please enter those in chat and we'll, we'll be sure to address those before the, uh, before the program ends. Uh, you can move the chat box, of course, and the captions by clicking and holding and dragging to where you want those to be so you're not overlapping information. A, word, a quick word about HLAA membership in you. Um, a message well worth repeating. HLAADC is a volunteer uh, organization. Your membership and participation make these kinds of programs and other activities possible, including advocacy. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce finally, after three years of advocacy, that DC's Office of Deaf, Deafblind, and Hard of Hearing is currently in the process of interviewing finalist candidates for the director position. When that's announced by the mayor, then that finalist director can hire staff, open the office, and we will have a resource finally that 38 other states already have in place. Um, the fee for getting back to membership, the fee for, HL, for HLA in membership is only $45 a year. That includes national and, and the chapter. And you can access that by going to hearingloss.org slash membership. I'll put that that link in the uh, in the chat box. Um, and I want to thank you all also for RSVPing the survey monkey. That's something new this year. And I know there's a couple more steps to, to answer some questions, but we're really working hard to ensure that we understand everyone's needs and it's two-way communication. So thank you very much for using survey monkey. On that, if you requested you'd like get more information about our chapter or be on the mailing list or about uh, membership, that information will get out to you within a week. Thank you for those, those inquiries and any further information, just let anyone on the board know. Um, one way to get involved with the chapter painlessly is by using Amazon Smile, which is a service provided by Amazon for not, -pro not for profits. And let me turn this over to, to Lisa Ewan who, who provided this suggestion to get us involved and now our chapter is ready to use this and she can explain further. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, uh, Judy. Can you, can everyone hear me? Okay, I see my captioning. So um, yeah, so Amazon Smile, uh, some of you may already know about it. It's been around for years and basically it's a really, pretty much effortless way that people can help out our chapter. Um, all you have to do is the next time you log into Amazon to shop is we would just ask you to log in with a special link, which uh, I'm gonna put in the chat box. Oh wait, hold on, let me do that again without the comma. Um, and this will just take you, you just log in with your same Amazon login and password. It's the exact same Amazon with the same products and the same prices, everything. The only difference is, is that we've registered our chapter so that anything you buy, if you log in using this link, Amazon donates a small percentage of the purchase price back to our chapter. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's a small amount, but as Judy said, we're all volunteer organization. We don't have a lot of ways of, of raising funds and every cent helps. So we're, we're just asking people, you know, if you shop on Amazon anyway, this is just 
something you can do that really takes no effort except maybe a couple minutes to log in using this link. And we might just get a few extra dollars per quarter um, that can go to like our captionist at the meetings. Hopefully when we get back in person, we can use it towards um, having some more social events and things like that. So if anyone has any questions, like if you have any problems logging in or you know, um, just need help to, to sign up, you can email me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat box as well. So that's it. I might repeat this at future meetings um, just to you know, kind of ingrain it in people's minds. So just warning you if you hear me repeat this. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Lisa. And you know, as Lisa said, I, even I did it and I'm not the most technically literate person. Um, and I certainly with COVID, a lot of us are using Amazon a lot. And this is a way that a, a small piece, same cost to me, the user, but a small percentage will go to our chapter as a nonprofit. So I'd encourage you all, if you have any questions about using it, um, you know, please contact Lisa. She's our, she's our technical guru. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you again, Lisa. Um, Russ, over to you now to introduce our program, please. Thanks. Thanks, Judy. Uh, before I do that, just one further note. Our next program uh, will be the next regularly scheduled program will be April 23rd. And note that that is a Saturday. Typically, we do our programs on Sunday afternoon. But this one, you know, out of accommodation to our spe speaker for that day will be on a Saturday afternoon. And our speaker will be Kristen Scoresby. And she's going to be talking about COVID-19 behavior changes and especially masking and its effects on communications and the mental health of people with, you know, with hearing loss. Those of you who are on our uh, mailing list, um, yes, you will be getting an announcement of that program a little bit later, you know, as the date approaches. And uh, the sign up procedure will be printed through SurveyMonkey, just as I think, you know, Judy, um, you know, was describing a little earlier. Okay. For today's program, our presenter today, Rohima Badri is a hearing health professional with over 20 years of experience. Her goal is to integrate her research and clinical expertise for providing the highest quality of hearing care. After receiving her PhD degree in audiology and hearing sciences from Northwestern University, she pursued her career as a research audiologist at New York University as a visiting science at the City University of New York, and then as a clinical audiologist, diagnosing, treating, and helping people with hearing disabilities live their best lives. In her other roles, including as a member of the expert advisory panel for the Hearing Health Foundation's Keep Listening campaign, she is currently focused on raising awareness and promoting hearing and mental health. And with that, I will turn this over to, no, you didn't come to hear me speak. So I'm going to turn that over to Bohema. And thank you once again for doing this for us. Thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you everyone uh, for coming and uh, thank you for having me. Um, this was, uh, has been, this was a great experience preparing for this presentation. And uh, I learned a lot too while doing this. And uh, one thing I noticed was that I saw so many resources, so many high top quality um, educational materials out there. And I was thinking, gosh, there's so many uh, you know, toolkits and are people aware of this? So I'm glad that HLA is bringing people who need them, you know, be it educators, audiologists, parents of people who have hearing loss to those resources. So I'm, I'm very happy to do that today. So uh, let me just uh, screen share my presentation here. Okay. 
Trying to do. All right. So do you see them? Okay. Now, how do I minimize that? Okay. So today's topic, as you guys know, is hearing loss in children and young adults. What's the impact, the challenges they face, and what we can do to improve uh, to live their best life. All right. Now. Uh, I can't. All right. Now, what does the younger population think of hearing loss? Um, most usually they think it's a sign of old age and they, all, uh, they also think that it only affects senior citizens. And in one study, they, uh, the authors report that 76% of college students believed that they would not lose their hearing until a later age. So, but the reality is hearing loss happens sooner than later. Now, this is a chart that was published by NIDCD, and you see that it's more on the lower end of the spectrum, unfortunately, than the higher end of the spectrum. See that we start to lose hearing as early as 20 years of age. And in some, unfortunately, it's even sooner. A 12 person starts at around six to 19 years of age, uh, which is pretty significant. Now, just too many numbers here. I'll just um, so it just says that hearing loss is more common in younger people. WHO uh, estimates around 34 million children under the age of 15 have disabling hearing loss, where 7.5 million of them are under the age of five. And CDC reports 15 percent uh, have some amount of measurable hearing loss at ages 16 to 19, and every six to eight middle and high school students have a measurable noise-induced hearing loss. Now, unfortunately, WHO predicts that this is going to be an increasing trend. By 2050, nearly 2.5 billion people are projected to have some degree of hearing loss, and 1 billion young adults are at risk for noise-induced hearing loss. Now, what is the impact of hearing loss on children and young adults? Now, in terms of infants and younger children, we all know now that hearing loss affects uh, predominantly speech and language uh, development. Now, one thing here is that you see, as you see in these pictures, is these pathways, the sensory pathway, language, and higher cognitive functions, they mature really fast. So, the mantra is here is to identify early and start early intervention or else there's going to be a huge delay and deficit in language skills. And there are a lot of established studies and uh, oh, sorry. so basically if you identify uh, and intervene uh, at the before six months of age, these children have better vocabulary, general language ability, speech intelligibility, even social emotional development, and even better for parents. It's, it improves parental bonding and parental grief resolution. So as I show in this graph here, you see that it's, it, this is the language scores and see how high they are for the children who are identified at the age of uh, zero to six months, and anything after that, they never catch up to the uh, normal, normal range, or even in terms of vocabulary, you see at the age of, at the birth, at the age of identification hearing loss is at birth to six months, they do catch up. But when they go beyond six months, they not even have a worsening gap, but also there's a deficit. So they don't match up and you know it just worsens as you age on. Now, what are the impact? What is the impact of hearing loss on school age children? Now, this stage is very crucial for language competence, academic achievement, and also psychosocial development. So at this age, the hearing loss is very far reaching. Like as you've seen in this graph, there is social skills, grades in school, emotional health, relationship, peers and family, and their self-esteem. Everything gets impacted. So this is actually uh, the in viewpoints of educators and parents, how much is the impact of hearing loss on these kids. And one major point is the academic achievement. Now, if the children at this age group did not get appropriate intervention, 
the children even mild to moderate hearing loss perform one to four grades lo level lower. And with children with severe to profound hearing loss, if there's no proper uh, early intervention is given, they achieve no higher than third or fourth grade. And also, as we saw in the vocabulary, same thing for this age group, the gap widens as the children progress through school. So one of the reason is uh, what this uh, author says, the cascading effect. So to begin with, these children in the classroom are going to get frag fragmented information. There's an information gap to start with. So that increases effort. So in order to fill up the gaps, they need to allocate more cognitive resources. So for example, if they're going to do multitasking, the normal children are going to be doing multitasking. These children have to take the cognitive resources that allocate for the multitasking, and they have to put in the increased if, uh, effort to get the hearing, you know, if there's, without any information gap. And also the acoustics in the classroom uh, is going to, everything is going to go, uh, lead to this increased fatigue. And they say that the fatigue they uh, face in the classroom is comparable to chronic health conditions. So all this together is going to, so the information gap in the classroom is going to translate to a learning gap and uh, thereby it's going to give a result in a decreased pace of learning and affecting the uh, academic achievement. Now, Adolescent stage is also very crucial for social rela relationship. The social emotional skills are developing at this stage. And one of the most challenging uh, part for them is uh, the group activities and social interactions. Now, as you see in this graph, this, this study was done in the United Kingdom. Um, you see that most of the activity that is of that needs uh, social interaction and group interaction is has the major or at least moderate impact assembly, outdoors, group work, during class teaching that is in, th in the classroom environment. Only in talking a one-on-one -on -one situation is, shows a minimal impact. Same goes true for at home or even sporting events, conversation with the family, friends, all shows moderate impact or at least major impact, but when only one-on-one, -on -one, even some people do show moderate, but they also say minimal impact. So these group, these age group children face a lot of challenges due to hearing loss in group situations. And uh, because of that, uh, because of the challenges in social situations, they go through isolation, rejection. So that leads to many social disturbances like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, and also behavioral problems like aggression, ODD, and conduct disorder. Now, one thing we always, uh, not but most often we forget is that uh, these children with hearing loss coexist with other disabilities, like learning difficult, like this uh, graph shows, uh, you know, the percentage of distribution of these other disabilities that coexist with the hearing loss. And there's this learning, it's as close to 50%, learning difficulties, language and speech difficulties, social, emotional uh, uh, difficulties, and even aut autism, visual impairment, and other health problems. So uh, one thing I want to bring into focus at this point is that uh, all of these uh, challenges that I just talked to you about does not, uh, you know, it, it's irrespective of a degree or laterality of hearing loss. So it be it a severe to profound or even a minimal hearing loss, be it both sided hearing loss or just one side unilateral hearing loss, it doesn't matter. These kids face the same amount of problem that the severe to profound hearing loss uh, children face. Even a minimal hearing loss of 25 dBHL, they seem to have language and learning problems. Um, they have poor school performance and they also uh, have a lot of emotional and behavioral uh, problems. So that, that's one thing I want to uh, bring your focus into. Now, young adults. Now, young adults are in a, a threshold of new beginnings. They're starting a new career. They are, you know, going to, into higher education, starting new social relationships. So, the 
challenges they face here is entirely new. And there's also um, barriers and discrimination in seeking paid employment. So employability opportunities are again challenging for these uh, this age group. And there's also ongoing challenges in terms of use of telephone, again, group activities. And as Russell mentioned um, in the beginning, so the next present or uh, next Saturday, I mean, in April, you would know more about it is there's new challenges uh, this group of uh, uh, hearing impaired uh, young adults faces adapting to communication in virtual remote environment that's been happening for past two years, also with masks. So how to communicate with a person whom they are communicating with has been wearing masks. All that is uh, very challenging to this age group. Now, in a nutshell, impact of hearing loss in children and young adults, speech and language development is affected, academic performance, career opportunities, psychosocial and emotional development and overall well-being, and not to mention our economy. There is an economic cost to treated and untreated hearing loss. There's a link to it. If you're interested, you can go in and read more about it. So it is, so because of all this, uh, you know, uh, cascading effect of all these uh, challenges, it is important to strive to identify each and every child with hearing loss and start the intervention process in a timely manner. But the question is, are we geared to do that? Now, right now, we measure what we call a, a hearing loss, is a purely a clinical approach. We use peer to audiometry as a gold standard, and any uh, a data, one data point to, for screening is like uh, the peer to average uh, equal to or about 25 dBHL is considered clinically hearing impaired. Now, that's one data point, remember, and is this approach enough to capture majority of children with hearing loss? Is this approach enough to capture the complex consequences that we just talked about of the hearing loss? Now, WHO proposed a holistic approach in the sense there's one part, side, there is this clinical, uh, which they call as impairment, it's a loss of sensory function. I can't hear. So that's what we measure and we use the gold standard of PTA average, okay? I mean, a pure tone average. So then the next step is the disability. You know, what I can't hear, but what did you say? And then the handicap situation, the, uh, how this uh, hearing loss is keeping you away from the daily activities. So other way of looking at it is how the hearing loss is affecting you when you're on one-on-one -on -one situation, when you're interacting with the family, the second circle, just a little bit outer, you know, social interaction. And then you look at how the hearing loss is affecting your educational achievement, your employability, and what are the economic issues that's stemming from it? So you need to just not take one data point or just a clinical approach of how much you don't hear, but what are the repercussions of hearing loss on all this uh, entirety, in entirety. So that's the uh, you know uh, approach WHO is proposing actually for the noise induced hearing disability, but works for any other hearing loss too. So a broader impact of hearing loss should be considered not just the clinical measure. And the other thing is just doesn't matter if it's a mild or it's a severe, doesn't matter if the child has a bilateral impairment or a unilateral impairment, or it doesn't matter. Uh, the third point is in with respect, this is like we are very far, far behind this, is what are the lived experiences of these children, you know, in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic background, all our rehabilitation identification process has to be sen uh, sensitive to this. So uh, that's the halfway point there. And now we are going into, um, all right, so these are the challenges and this is what we have that uh, we have a clinical measure, but what we have to aim is more holistic. And where are we now? So what needs to be done? Okay, in terms of ident identifying an intervention, we know that where we have uh, 
EHDI, the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program. Uh, this is practiced in all 50 states and District of Columbia. So uh, the guidelines are that hearing screening be completed by one month of age, diagnosis of any hearing loss by three months of age, and early intervention by six months of age, just to uh, take uh, make the most of our brain plasticity that we just saw, the three curves that just you know mature so fast, the peak hits so fast. And uh, so this is the algorithm that EHDI follow that, you know, the new, uh, 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 newborn hearing screening, the hospital, they, they screen, and then when they fail, screen or miss, or if the screen is, is incomplete for any reason, they need to come back before one month of age. And the reports need to be submitted to a EHDI program. So this is the basic guideline. And in the diagnosis, so beyond that, you have to, uh, the child has to, if they fail, the child has to be referred to a complete audiological evaluation. And doesn't matter, I see as an audiologist, this sometimes gets missed out is, doesn't matter if the child has a normal hearing result or it, uh, the child comes up with a hearing loss, needs to be reported to the state EHDI program. And, um, after that, you get to the next step, ask app, that you get to the counseling, you, you uh, counsel the parents about what are the options available, you, but in hand in hand, you get an uh, autological team involved, you do a medical clearance, and you start talking and start uh, intervening with the hearing aid fitting. And also, we uh, this is a time where you also involve the IDEA. Um, we're going to talk more about just uh, one more slide about it. Uh, the Individuals uh, uh, with Disabilities Education Act, and then um, the intervention. You go into the intervention, and you also monitor. The, these are the second steps of the uh, EHDI. So with IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, you get ex help that is needed uh, in terms of uh, for infants and toddlers through Part C and for ages three to 21 um, if under the IDEA uh, Part B. So what kind of help? So you, the parents get a lot of help in terms of how to how to stay on schedule. Are the are the uh, children on schedule in terms of speech, language, and communication skills and development? And they also help them to understand more about the child's hearing loss and what are the uh, special communication needs they they want to pursue and keep track of child's progress and make any decisions regarding their intervention and education. Now there is also a program for uh, uh, children from low income families. There's a head, the early Head Start that's for pregnant women and families with children under the age of three and Head Start for three to five, uh, three and five years old. Okay, now where are we or how are we doing with this screening and intervention? According to the report from the by CDC uh, 2019, so far so good, they say that 98% of US newborn in the United States are screened for hearing loss. And this number was just 5%. So they say they're doing very well in terms of newborn screening, but that is not as good as in terms of rescreening. So this something called loss to follow up. So that is number of infants that are referred that we saw in the chart, the first of the uh, half of the chart, um, referred because of any reason they failed the screening or missed the screening or the screening was incomplete on the final screen, but did not return for the diagnostic testing. So that is where you lose them for the audiological follow-up. And this has been reported around 40%, but it varies greatly through racial and demographic, uh, 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 there are racial and demographic disparities in this. Um, and in one study, they showed that some of the reason could be because the hospitals where the screening is uh, done, they have an adequate understanding of what, how important this, uh, out of this re-screening procedure is. Probably there's a lack of audiologist support or involvement. And in this particular study, there were a high rate of infants who were Hispanic or mothers with uh, less than 12 years of education. 
So what do you do? So the same study suggests that you educate the hospitals, especially the personnel in the newborn intensive care units about the importance of out outpatient rescreening, and you provide the audiology support. You provide an oral and written information in the parents' native language, and also a team approach. All parents, doctors, nurse practitioners, audiologists, and social workers, they have to come together to reduce this uh, loss to follow-up ratios. All right. It also helps for parents and caregivers to know what to look for. Okay, I have uh, put some links here that has very good resources for what uh, to look for, like whether the babies start at loud noises, do they turn uh, to the sources, say single words before the age of one, um, and if their speech is delayed, if speech is not clear, don't follow directions, or sometimes the turn of the volume too high. So also, it helps for the caregivers and the parents to know how to prevent hearing loss. Um, just like how parents are keen on practicing uh, healthy dental hygiene, it would really help if the parents also talk to kids, start them in about uh, healthy hearing practices, how to hear, um, you know, how not to hear loud music, always dial it down, and use of hearing protection devices when they are uh, in a loud noise exposed arenas. All right, and also noisy planet health. A lot of resources for parents, not just educational materials, it's interactive. Uh, uh, so you can do activities with the kids and, you know, to explain to them the uh, dangers of noise. This, what are the source of noise and how to keep a home quieter or how to pre uh, protect hearing using HPDs. So th there's a lot of resources there. So I've also this uh, attached some more uh, links here. The first one from CDC has an exhaustive uh, link about the organizations and all the other educational institutions and uh, help uh, resource uh, toolkits that uh, help parents. Um, and uh, please check out this Boys Town Hospitals resources. It's really a lot about early intervention programs. Asha and also infanthearing.com about uh, you know how to um, what signs to look for. So they, these are great, great top-notch uh, links. All right, now that was for the children, uh, for the infants and younger children. So how are we doing with school-age children and young adults? Now that was very promising when we said there is 98% of screening and all that, but here we are lagging behind. We have a long way to go in terms of in, we are in that, we have inadequate sensitive testing measures for early identification. We have inadequate classroom accommodation. There's a, a huge gap in terms of knowledge about minimal and unilateral hearing losses and also of noise induced hearing loss. There's also a lack of hear, uh, awareness in terms of noise-induced hearing loss and use of hearing uh, protection devices. So this was one study that, you know, as I said, usually it's the 25 dB is used as a uh, referral criterion. Again, there's no standards, but you know, across uh, most of the schools use that. So this one study, st uh, study looked at how the sensitivity changes. You know, if you have just reduce it by five dB to 20 dB, to 25. Uh, the, so you see here 20 dB HL, the sensitivity is 62. And when you just increase it to five, look how it just has the sensitivity falls really 38, but nothing much changes with specificity. So that means that with just by increasing 5 dB, you are missing a lot of children with hearing loss. So you're not capturing uh, people enough people so you can help them with intervention. And again, this is just a graph showing how across the uh, grades, the referral uh, falls when it's 20, 20 dBHL, look at the uh, referral, it just falls drastically when you just increase 5 dBHL. So what do we have to do for that? One is lower the cutoff for hearing, uh, so make it 20 dBHL as a criterion. 
again, redefine the screening and detection st standard. First of all, have a standard across schools and then uh, redefine the standards for minimum so that you don't miss out minimal hearing loss because as we said, even these people and unilateral hearing loss, they, they do face same kind of challenges that severe to profound hearing loss face. So also so that we don't miss the early onset of noise induced hearing loss. And another uh, important is multi-stage screening. Um, just because they passed or failed, you know, that's not be all end all, just have multiple checkpoints throughout the school year and monitor for any other signs. Just because they pass the hearing screening, um, you know, it happens in a noisy situation. So they can be, you know, you can miss the, probably they pass, but they might have some hearing loss. So just don't use that as a, a gold standard. Just monitor for any other struggles that the kids are facing, any other signs. So in terms of intervention measure, you have individualized education programs, the IEPs. Um, they, are just, they are truly individualized, a document based on students' unique needs. All, it's a team approach again, parents, teachers, staff, school staff, and students work together. So they come to a point that you know, there, is a, there, there is a plan that help them progress through the, it's a help to aid, aid them go through the general curriculum. And studies have shown that it works. So in one study, uh, children with unilateral hearing loss with IEPs had a faster rate of increase in verbal test scores compared to those students who did not, uh, with the unilateral hearing loss, who did not have the IEPs. And also the most important thing that these kids do uh, face a lot of mental health problems. Um, so, uh, the, the study that came very recently, they have uh, done an ex uh, extensive review on what kind of mental health support these children with hearing loss uh, get. And they say there's a broad range of therapy, counseling, targeted training programs are there for these kids. They target their psychological well being through counseling, psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. And they also target their behavioral problems through skill building, role play exercises. So they're, they're all out there. Um, but I don't know how much is the people know that there, there are those resources, they, they access to so the education, the, the team, school team members with the educational audiologists, everybody, uh, and just social workers, clinical schools, clinical uh, psychologists, they all have to come together because they, the, the study says that they get work, they prove to be effective. And the most that works is that the, the intervention is offered at the school level because it's it combines with other educational support programs. So that seems to be more beneficial for these kids. And of course, the audiological support. So um, you don't have to go fancy, just some simple classroom accommodations go a long way, but sadly, uh, schools and uh, classrooms are lacking in them. Um, these are generally the main aim for this is to increase auditory access. Like as we said, they have this fragmented hearing that goes to their brain. So increase the, uh, fill, fill, help them to fill those gaps and decrease distractions. So one, simple ways preferential seating just by making the uh, child sit closer to the teacher away from all these other noise sources like heating units ac uh, units open windows hallways which are generally seems to be more noisier goes a long way again re uh, reducing reflective surfaces so when a teacher talks the speech rate just doesn't go in uh, directly to the ears but it bounces off on chairs, tables, and it's going to smear the speech. So just use of curtains, carpet, soft floor tiles, again, help the uh, echo. And um, again, reducing additional noise sources from HVAC, squeaky doors helps reduce the distractions from um, you know, uh, unwanted sound sources. I huge, huge help they get from um, hearing assistive technology. So again, main aim for these uh, technologies is to reduce noise and increase the signal to noise ratio. The teacher's um, speech is going, uh, needs to be high up uh, and all the other noises, you know, a couple of kids talking, hallway, all well, has to be down. 
So conventional hearing aids that the kids wear, children wear, that goes a long way. They, right now, there's there are a lot of sophisticated processes that's in there that really increases the uh, SNR uh, signal to noise ratio. But the classroom acoustics is very notorious. It's uh, the, it's very complex. So uh, it, conventional hearing aids will only go so far. So with that, you know, you need some additional help, like oh, some classrooms uh, use uh, what's called the classroom audio distribution systems cans. It's more not more not like a hearing aid doesn't so not so much amplifies it, but it distributes the sound. The teacher is standing here and goes to a loudspeaker and it distributes the sound. The advantage of this is that even children who has a minimal hearing loss, who is not fitted with a hearing aid, even normal hearing, even uh, people who have normal hearing have problem listening to speech in noisy situations. So this will benefit those kids who are not fitted with hearing aids, um, but it gives an increased uh, signal to noise ratio for them. But that is true only if the classroom acoustics is favorable, it's quiet, which is not really so. There are lots of noises. So most often this system proves to be more detrimental than helpful. It kind of smears the speech and it further confuses the children. So, but right now the most successful, most popular one is personal FM system. So it it's, from the teacher, the, the, there's a trans microphone and then the mi transmitter goes directly into the uh, child's uh, ear. So the signal to noise uh, ratio is really, uh, you know, the speech is uh, preserved uh, and, the, and the child gets very good signal to noise ratio and less distraction from other sound sources. And it's proved to be very effective, very successful as many studies have come out. And as you see in this study, if compared just wearing hearing aids, uh, and you know you have this uh, sound uh, cans as I uh, mentioned before, and then the, the person left them, and then you see that the the amount of uh, the the speech recognition score is really high when they use the personal FM system, and comparable is the desk uh, desktop FM system, but FM system works um, for these. It, proves to be beneficial for these children. So again, this is a team approach. You know, everybody, the main players are the teachers, the educational audiologists, the parents. So educational audiologists really, uh, you, if, if the school or the teacher, if they want input, what kind of uh, uh, amplification system they need to use in the classroom to aid the children, um, you can go to an educational audiologist for input. The uh, audiologist will also provide uh, um, a game plan, um, supports, counsels the children, uh, you know, to make it all come together. So, um, so it's really uh, good to uh, use that resource. All right. Now, how can teachers help? And this is a very nice um, kind of sheet, uh, sheet you have from Center of Hearing and Communication. A, um, you know, just a small document, uh, tips for uh, teachers. Um, Basically, get to know your student, what their needs are, and you know you can um, help them communicate in the classroom by keeping the noise uh, to a minimum, by you enunciating and projecting your voice, enunciating your words, and address the child by name so the child knows that you're talking to that, uh, that child. Repeat the question. Um, give a written copy of notes before the, uh, in the beginning of the class do check-ins, um, turn on the closed captioning when playing videos in class and learn to operate the FM system. Uh, just the ones that, you know, uh, the kids are uh, familiar with the use in the classroom. All right, now this presentation is not complete. We don't mention about the noise induced hearing loss uh, because it is right now the most common and the growing problem in this uh, adolescent and the young adults. It's called silent danger or silent epidemic, not only because their, their early symptoms um, are very subtle to notice. 
It is also because there is a lack of awareness on the dangers of the loud noise. There is a lack of awareness in the use of HPDs. And there is also lack of sensitive tool to detect the potential in IHL. You know, the, as I said, the cutoff is so, you know, 25 and um, not enough to capture these kids who show these early onset of um, uh, noise induced hearing loss in one study the the school based screening we have currently will only identify 22% uh, percent of students so that's really really low sad part is once the hearing loss sets in there's no turning back it's an irreversible damage so it's better to have a sensitive measure than to you know scramble for resources to uh, try to rehabilitate them so this was one extensive study that was done by CDC in 2020 uh, in school-based settings. Uh, what are the awareness about noise-induced hearing loss? And uh, it's really dismal. Three in four teenage students were exposed to loud sounds and 80, around 86% uh, reported that schools did not provide HPDs during activities of loud sounds. Out of seven out of 10 were never taught how to protect their hearing. So we are very, very, very far behind. Uh, so one of the things I am very vested in and I'm, uh, I truly do right now is uh, through Hearing Health Foundation Keep Listening campaign. We are trying to create programs to reach out to these younger population. Uh, you know, why we are looking at questions, like why is that the awareness in this age group is so low? So probably it's because that, you know, we lack programs and practices that resonate with youth. It's like a one size fits all programs, uh, the hearing conservation programs doesn't make any difference to these people. Uh, it doesn't talk their language. So in my um, article uh, in Hearing Health Foundation website, you can find six ways to raise youth awareness of noise induced hearing loss, how to connect to them, how to, um, so I talk about uh, just not giving them a brochure and saying, okay, this, this, this is going to affect you. Just having more interactive projects so that, you know, they not only just remember, but also they are interested and they invested in it. Second is just because these, this age group is aware that, uh, aware of dangers of noise, uh, doesn't mean that they will put it into practice. There's a huge gap of, uh, between awareness and practice. So in my second article, I have told, uh, I have written about what, what are the, what are the barriers these children face? You know, uh, there is peer pressure, you know, even though a person knows, okay, this is really loud, they, they still go and uh, you know, go to a loud concert without wearing uh, hearing protection devices because there's a stigma attached to wearing hearing protection de devices among their peers. So there, is, there, is, there are their beliefs, attitude, peer pressure. There's also cultural influence that stops them from putting what they know to practice. So uh, if we start addressing all that, probably we can make some leeway into the, in this population. So again, for helping uh, school-age children, parents, uh, educators, anybody who wants to, there is a lot, these are the links uh, that you know, gives again, a lot of examples, a lot of interactive activities. Um, so you can go in and check it out. There is this Noisy Planet, it has a lot, a lot of interactive activities for um, educators, parents, um, in you know, raising awareness of noise induced hearing loss. So you're almost there. So last but not the least, self-advocacy. It's a very, very important skill that a person should have for anything and also for uh, hearing loss, for children with hearing loss. So self-advocacy is just not speaking up for yourself, just you know, standing up for, no, it's just not that. It's you have to learn how to get the information, how uh, find out who you uh, you will uh, who will support you who who is uh, who can champ the uh, champion for you. You have to know about your rights and responsibilities, and also not just for yourself. You know, just helping the fellow your fellow member. You know, uh, lead the best quality of life. So it's all about that. It's just not about you know speaking uh, up, uh, up for yourself, but a lot more than that. And it has to be taught from young age. 
Uh, it's a very important skill to have. And in terms of children, uh, they, you have to see whether the child understands age appropriate medical information and, and implication, what, what kind of degree, what kind of hearing loss the child has and how it's going to affect him. And also very uh, uh, daily uh, issues a child face, uh, faces, needs to uh, troubleshoot it, checks and cleans the device, do a self-test of technology, I mean, whether his hearing aid, their hearing aid is working or not. You know, related to classroom accommodation, you know, if the child runs into a problem, has to stand up and notify the teacher that, you know, the, this, he, he, child is facing trouble or he himself or the child himself uh, positions in a, uh, for a best listening situation and also asks for the child uh, teacher to repeat if the child misses. So these are small things, but Hendrix 2015, they have a whole lot of other uh, variables that a child, like, you know, even as young as preschooler um, would uh, you know, it can, you know, can develop these self-advocacy skills. It's very, very interesting. In terms of young adults with hearing loss, again, uh, are they able to understand your hearing loss, uh, prevention and intervention strategies? Can they explain their hearing loss and the te hearing technology they use to their peers, employers? Um, are they able to manage uh, and troubleshoot their uh, uh, hearing assistive devices and find out what are the support services that are available if they want to go for a higher education and also identify and advocate for accommodations in your workplace. For example, you know, if you need a closed captioning, you need alerts by, via text, you know, you go and speak uh, about these things and, uh, you know, you can go to human resources and talk about uh, your what accommodation uh, that you need for your disability. So again, Americans uh, uh, with Disabilities Act protects hearing impaired people, uh, knowing the rights, uh, like, you know, for example, mm, discrimination by public government uh, entities is uh, prohibited by uh, ADA. Government buildings require accessibilities to assistive listening devices like loops, caption telephones, telephones has to be compatible with hearing aids. The, uh, if uh, young adults know about all this, they can self-advocate effectively. So again, there are resources for self-advocacy. There's this beautiful checklist that uh, Phonak has. Uh, if you're really interested, you must check that out. And it, it's it's very, uh, you know, you it's a, it has boxes, and you can as as you learn about each thing, you can check it out, and you know, you can just keep it with you, uh, you know. Uh, it, it covers everything from a, a young age to up to, uh, you know, what help you can ask uh, to your employer. Everything is covered. So it's, a, it's one good uh, checklist to um, go and check it out. So that's about it. So thank you. Thank you for uh, um, uh, hearing uh, HLA for, uh, you know, um, inviting me to do this because as I said, there are lots of resources and, you know, uh, HLA and Russell, uh, people working for these organizations, they're being a connector to the people who need them and all these beautiful resources out there. So I'm, I'm really happy that I was able to do that today for you guys. Thank you so much. Um... Let me, let me go to the chat, chat box because there, there's one entry here which Wait, was not phrased in, um, in in terms of a question, but in a sense really is. And she basically says, this is from Eloise, I would love to have your PowerPoint to help raise awareness around here. Um, is that, first of all, can we make that available? Because I think that would be very helpful not only to Eloise, but obviously to many other people as well. Gladly. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, why don't we open it up then to other questions and comments? Um, I, I, I let, let me start. Um, you know, I, I guess it occurs to me that at all stages, beginning, you know, with newborns, um, what you're talking about really is a need for 
and in one place you made it quite explicit for te a team approach involving a whole um, panoply of different specialties and so forth, you know, to provide the services that um, that are needed by by young people, and e even starting at the at the very earliest age. I mean, we know that in this country, at least, and probably in several others, I think as well, virtually all newborns are screened. Um, however, at the same time, there isn't, uh, there's a lot of fallout, you know, between the screening and the actual provision of services. Um, I think an awful lot of parents, you know, um, the, the last thing they want with their, with their new lovely newborn is to be told that, hey, there's a problem here, or there may be a problem here. Um, so there's a certain sense, you know, in some cases of denial, there's, you know, there's confusion. And in many cases, I think the, the staff, you know, um, at, at, at hospital facilities don't necessarily know an awful lot or stress. So you get an awful lot of feedback. You get a lot, all the kids are screened, but an awful lot of them don't get you know, the attention that they need. And they need it, as you pointed out, very carefully and correctly, it, you know, it seems to me, the need for intervention at a very early age, if the child is, you know, to develop between communication skills and not to fall behind in an educational level, they should be treated very early. But a lot of them aren't. And I guess the real question I'm in my mind, and I don't know if there's, there's no answer, is an answer is how you develop, how we de get the resources necessary to provide the kinds of services, you know, which which we're talking about. And it even gets, I mean, I mean, when you talked about, you know, specifically, you know, in school settings and a team approach, which would involve teachers and nurses and counselors and social workers and audiologists and speech language pathologists. Um, it, it just seems to me, you know, that I mean, absolutely, but I, you know, how, 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 how do we get there from here? I, guess. I, I, have, I have thought about this, about, especially with the newborns a lot. One place where the parents are in, see, when they are screened, when they're getting out of the hospital, they have too many things in their minds. So they, they are thinking about the whole, you know, everything is new. New parents are already, you know, they are, they are overwhelmed, right? So hearing at that point might not look as too much of a big thing to think about. Even if somebody, some nurse is saying, oh, you know what? There was this thing we might, uh, maybe the child, uh, your uh, baby failed. We want you to come back. It's all like noise for them. Okay, they're thinking about, you know, it's just basic feeding, you know, they are, they are having problems with breastfeeding. So, so that is like, there's so many, many, many layers away. So what I would think is when they go home, settle down and things come back to normal within four to five days. And then the, the point of contact there is the pediatrician. They, they have to be in regular touch with them. And you, they, they have to, you know, there are certain protocols they have to follow. They have to weigh the kid. They have to see the child is, you know, putting on weight. The feeding is going in the right direction. So at that point, reaching out to the pediatrician, the, the nurses in that clinic or in the private setting, you know, asking them to put on a brochure, a brochures available there, put on, you know, um, probably on the walls, like, you know, how important the newborn's the screening you have to keep up with it you know that would be the point or even the pediatrician rem rem reminding that uh, mother the new parents the new mother and father you know or care caregivers that how important they have to be about hearing uh, health in in combination with other things would be the best approach because they are the ones who are constantly in touch with new parents at the beginning of the you know the first three months so I would, I would think that would be the best way to, you know, break the thing in, you know, get in the information then. Um, because again, we have, the, there's an urgency, 
you know we have to get to them and uh, uh, and these people the pediatricians are the ones would be a beautiful bridge to do that for us at this point I think you're muted. Uh, uh, we don't. We are not hearing uh, you, Russell. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I I, I had muted myself. Yeah. I, I was going to say other questions, comments, follow on. I thought Judy had a question. Judy, you. Judy, you're muted. Let me unmute. Thank you. Um, terrific presentation. I Thank have a. You five month old grandson, my first. And when he had the hearing test at the hospital, I emailed my colleagues on the board and said, great news, you know, his hearing is okay. That was kind of proactive with newborns. When is testing done once they get into the school system? Is it all reactive? Like the teacher notices the child can't hear or are there as much as you as uh, as much as governments are at it on the newborn screening there yeah. again you know there the the main thing the problem is there there are no standards like the one we have in newborn screening we have a, a algorithm you know if this doesn't happen you ha you must the word must you must screen the infant by, you know, uh, by within first month, and you must do diagnosis of hearing loss within three months. There is, a, you know, clear guidelines when it comes to newborns, but sadly, that lacks when it comes to school going children. There is no standard procedures across schools. They are all like, you know, uh, I don't know, what do you do? What do you do? It's all so different. There is no, uh, you know, cut off or there's nothing systematic that they, uh, they have so that, you know, they can compare and say, okay, what works, what doesn't work. And uh, not even that many schools are even aware or can or uh, take the, uh, you know, advantage of uh, educational audiologists. There is this provision of asking the educational audiologist what can be done, what is a good thing to do for a student with hearing loss. And many uh, schools don't even think that way. You know, it's just everybody, they're just going with their own, uh, you know, what works with uh, their, you know, school board. And there's nothing standardized, nothing uh, that, you know, uh, as a guideline that they could follow that that's right now where they're scrambling you know they don't know there's to one point who is you know who is authorized to even say what to do or what not to do so it's all like everything is it's put together to at least a point of screening a newborn again when it comes to rescreening there's again you know too many things we lose kids we we lose up to 40 to 60 percent you know in even with uh, uh you know uh, uh uh, poorer demographics, we lose even more kids. They don't come back to screen uh, to rescreen. Um, so it's it's just not put together in any of the uh, uh, other places than it is in the newborn screening. They're doing a good job at least when you screen. Uh, but again, rescreening school and all the even even when the uh, children finish the schooling and they are transitioning into adults. So many people fall off the radar. You know, they don't go in and say, "Okay, right now um, the challenges are new." I there there are provisions again to help. Uh, IDEA helps you, but you know there are not many people who know that you know there's sort of resources are there for them to have a seamless transition from being a school child to an adult. So I guess to Russ's point. Um, in theory, but actually in execution, the resources can be difficult to put in place by and large. I mean, in a school environment, I would assume the child says, I'm having trouble hearing, and then maybe someone does something. It is. It, it is. It um, again, uh, you know, there are no set standards about what kind of what, what is the test that you could do 
what uh, you know, how many times you do. If they fail once, what happens? If they pass, do you do multiple checkpoints? Um, you know, and uh, what do do they do? Even the pediatricians that they 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 do some hearing tests at their clinics. Do they even communicate? to the teachers or to the education professionals back if the children have hearing loss. There are a lot of loopholes. There are a lot of gaps where, you know, uh, the communication doesn't happen and who gets affected? The child. They just fall in the cracks. And, uh, you know, again, with so many, again, the one more challenge is having hearing loss. It mimics so many things. So just to find out that this child has learning difficulties, not because of ADHD or not because of learning disability itself or not because of speech problems, but maybe because of hearing problems. To get to that, it takes a lot of time because of the sensitivity issues. Some children don't even uh, are are missed or not even captured because of setting the uh, uh, you know uh, the referral criteria so high. So they don't even, so they might be having all these uh, uh, problems at school because of hearing loss, but they might be, you know, diagnosed with some other problem. So, yeah. One quick follow-up. Um, how did it come to be that, the, that there is a law requiring test, hearing testing for newborns? Was that federal, state by state? I think it's, yeah, it's. I think it's a policy. Uh, you know, it's it's a federally mandated po policy. I think I might have to go check what was the you know the beginning. Some maybe somebody else would be able to uh, throw a, a light on that. But uh, definitely, all I can say right now is uh, it's pretty uh, well regulated uh, thing now. Um, you know, hospitals are, you know, supposed to screen the newborns. So um, there is a, there is a set of rules, guidelines, and I you know it's, it's very, uh, it runs like a probably, you know, I could use a well oil in, in all the states. And uh, just that they are saying, there's, it is, you know, I, I, I don't know whether I can use the word mandated, but it has been run in all the 50 states and uh, District of Columbia itself is, you know, is a Thank huge you. thing. Thank you very much. You had your hand up. Yes, yes. Uh, first, thank you very much. This is a, a excellent presentation. And thank you. Th thank you for all your efforts. This is what little I know about this is it's a hard nut to crack. You know, as you mentioned, there are a lot of cracks in the system. And, you know, one of them, you know, is this the newborn screening? And you mentioned the poor students, the, are the, the, the poor families, the health disparities. You have, in plus, you know, some of the parents just might not come back. And so it's tough to, you know, it's their choice. It's, it's tough to really be effective when, when that happens. And so, makes it difficult, but in your opinion, for an organization like ours, for those families that do come back, you know, with, with all the different disparities that are out there, how would you, would you have any recommendations for how an organization like ours could help? First, just doing these kind of presentations and you know putting it out there, you know, like you could just use all the resources that you know. That's one thing I found was there are a lot and lot of resources that's out there for parents, for new parents to be looking out for signs, you know, even if they 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 don't, you know, they they are too overwhelmed at the time when they are coming out of the hospital. They they there are bro there are checklists for these parents to just nothing, you know, wordy, just bang on to the point, what to look for in your kids, you know, just within the first uh, month, you know, if you drop a vessel, do you, do, do, does your child startle, you know, uh, so many kind of cues that you could look for, uh, subtle ones and big ones, uh, you know, uh, so that, you know, you, you just, 
if you even if you feel something uh, you know you you something is missing when in doubt you know just tell them you know when in doubt just go to a pediatrician or you know uh, at that time you know they are mostly linked to a pediatrician but you know that you they they would again you know hopefully they they are again it based on how uh, uh, how aware that clinic is but i would uh, um, think that a pediatrician would uh, uh, suggest what, what are the next logical steps to take. So one is that just educating these parents about, you know, self-advocacy, that's what it is. You know, they have to be a champion for their own kids. It's not going to be your pediatrician. It's not going to be a nurse in this hospital because each one of them are overwhelmed with their own duties. So as a parent of a newborn, you are the champion for your kid. So you need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, armor yourself with all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, signs to look for all the uh, support or uh, educational med. It's all out there. That's what when I was doing this presentation, like such dependable, top notch quality uh, links that are there from CDC to uh, other uh, research organizations, you know, research organization like yours, uh, Hearing Health Foundation, you have a lot of things that, you know, one thing is for these parents to find all these resources in one place and the questions, what are the questions they have in the mind? And then these are the places you will get the answers because it's all out there. You guys need to collate it, put it in there and tell the parents it's all there. All you have to do is just one click and the answers are there. And that is the best uh, thing you guys can do to the parents is get them close, get them to the uh, resource and, you know, uh, encourage them. And also for the newborn, we have to create the sense of urgency in the parents. They have to know, bang, bang, bang. The hearing stops develop, I mean, at least hearing matures within four months, three to four months. Language is contingent on the hearing. Language matures within eight months. It's all, and the higher cognitive functions happen, all matures within one, uh, one year. So if you want to make the most out of it, you need to get your hands in right now, not later. The, the urgency of neural plasticity, your brain is plastic only to a certain amount of time. And then it's not that I'm not saying that you're not going to learn, you're not going to, uh, the brain is going to be learning all throughout, but that kind of plasticity that you get within the first year of life, you never get anywhere. So make the most out of it, not not because your child will be delayed, but there is also deficits, but because they never may achieve that normalcy, which they can if they exploit the plasticity within the first year. So I think right now, um, education, that's it. Awareness and education is the key uh, to the parents uh, in terms of newborns, because they can do, they are just pooping and drinking milk you know, so there's nobody there to help them except for the parents and uh, you just have to uh show them the right people you know uh right i, I feel at the first three months i think they're going to they're going to see their i don't know whether they'll see their own parents or not but they definitely will be seeing their pediatrician more often so that is the place where they're going to get uh answers to everything so why not about hearing loss too so, um, yes. thank you very much. That helps a lot. Yeah, okay. yeah. If I could just follow up on that just briefly, yeah. you mentioned you talked before, particularly with respect to newborns, about the central role of a pedi pediatrician. And I guess, you know, and as you're pointing out here, um, early intervention is critical. How are pediatricians doing? in getting this across. Um, I, 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 I gather that not very well. Not very well. well, no. What, what do we do about this? I mean, how do we get this across? I mean, this is pretty important and it needs, as you're right, I mean, we, kids, kids ought to be getting their interventions they need at six months. Uh, that's, not, that's not very long. That, that's, yeah, a, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
I'll, I'll interject because uh, the, the first bill came out in 1997 and it was instituted because the NIH did a conference and study on infants and they found that a lot of the infants, you know, they were doing other studies on infants and lo and behold, they found that a lot of the infants were also hard of hearing. So it's another one of those studies that, you know, they were studying something else and then all of a sudden they found, you know, that they were having these hearing loss issues. So then the, the conference, you know, decided that because the, the, the substantial numbers were high, that they brought it to the attention of Congress and developed, you know, a bill that came out to be, you know, having it so that all the states were, you know, were supposedly have the screening. And there were already two states that were doing the screenings. So up until that time, you know, the two states eventually turned out to be 43 states. In 2017, President Trump reissued the bill so that pediatricians and anybody that were handling infants had to have the screenings redone because so many kids were falling out of that first initial step of the screenings because kids were, you know, moms were admitted and then discharged right after having their babies. Because when I had my baby, I was in the hospital for four or five days that you don't have anymore. You have your baby and then you go home. So the screenings are not done anymore because unless you have a team right there, you lose out on that screening. So now we have a new bill that tells everybody that we have a new screening that goes to the states and hopefully we'll have all 50 states that will be doing a better job. So the states now all have new bills, new screenings that go to the, you know, each municipality or community, you know, they are responsible for going to the schools, to anybody that has any kind of screenings. Because I know I'm doing that here in, in Florida. I'm looking in and working with the Kiwanis, but also my HLAA to look at kids who are falling through the cracks because you know it's our it's up to us to follow up for our kids because they're our future we have a bill that helps us it is even better than the 1997 bill so you can look it up you can find it it's um ed it's um it's a model you know it's a um Let's see, where is it here? New law to strengthen early hearing screening programs for infants and children. So you can Google it. Um, you know, so it's there. It's not far, it's not hard to find, and it will help you in all the states, you know, because it's it was made so it was written so that it can go to each of the states because it's a state, you know, uh, directed you know, sponsored programs so that you can work with your state legislators to make sure that it works for your children. So it's not a federal, you know, it's just federally written bill, but you and your constituents can work to work for the children. And that's where I'm going because I work with all my legislators and they like to listen to what I say. And then I'm going to actually work with our Hillsborough County. That's what I would say. Yeah, it's that's what I was going to say. One way for this is to come from top down. That is from by policy changes, advocates, you know, uh, more of you know getting all the the bigger players in the in the situation. But there's also down, the bot, I mean bottom to top. You know, those it's good that those things are happening, which is really great. Glad that you're doing that. It's beautiful which is very, 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 very needed. Yeah, um, it's also, again, it again, again, comes down to the parents or the caregivers of the child in question, be it a school-age children, be it a newborn. It's, if it, it, parents, ha they have to, uh, you know, arm up and 
you know, get 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 educated, and then so that they, when they go to their pediatrician, they can ask all the right questions. Or there is Google, so they you can Google up all the organizations that you know can help you know the parents of newborn, and uh, organizations like you know HLA and uh, you know others. There's so many, many, many. Uh, Asha, everybody, they 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 have in CDC, they have resources. So if all you have is this, you you have to have the right questions. If you are in doubt, just find out where, what, whom to ask. And you know, there are always there are the numbers there, 1-800 numbers you can call. And now that, you know, each and there are so many resources and toolkits that each and every person can become the advocate of whatever cause they are fighting for. So if you have, if you're in doubt in your next pediatrician visit, if you ask a question like, you know, I, I drop something and my my child or I'm calling the name that my child is not turning. So, you know, if if you're not satisfied with your pediatrician's answer, you can always, you know, have so many. It's not like we are living in, you know, uh, pre Google days. Now we have so many resources right at the, you know, click. So you, you you're there and there are lots of legitimate um, you know, sites that give you directions, what to do next, where to go. And these are the help you're going to get. And after this, what are the steps you can take from this uh, diagnostics to the intervention? I mean, you just go to an audiologist, they take care of you. After that, you know, you they, they report to uh, EHDI, then they set on with the intervention, the whole otolaring, the whole team comes together. So it's just that going to the right place at the right time. And I think the parents can just do it from right at the home. The other good thing is cochlear implants are being put in six-month-old children with astounding results. Just because, like you pointed out in your PowerPoint, that six-month window is where they have the, the greatest growth in yes. knowledge. And they have found that out because years ago, they only started at two years and they found mm -hmm. that that was a mistake. So yes. they dropped the standard of putting cochlear implants in children that are six months. And the, the statistics went off the wall when they started doing that. So yes. the International Congress that is working now to establish new standards internationally has it that they're going to do that, you know, internationally in all you know, all countries, just because the numbers are staggering. So that's what we want to be pushing is to make sure that parents understand that you yes. know it's not a lost cause. Yes. It's beautiful okay. and 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 mind-boggling thing. I mean, that's something that I wish that I had had because I'm a lost cause. Nothing was done for me. 69, 70 years ago. But I bet, it's wonderful could, for those now, you know, for kids. So if I could jump in real quick, I have a question, follow up question. You mentioned that the statistics are staggering when they started using cochlear implants and implanting at six months of age. Does that mean that? it was very successful in the development of speech and language and education or what is the what what other statistics are they referring to the advantage is that the child is able to first of all hear when they can't hear anything because when you think about the fact that they they had no sound or knowledge of noise you know because if you're thinking about, you know, when, if you take your hearing aids out or cochlear implant out, you don't hear anything. And that's what a child doesn't have the knowledge of, because I know I didn't hear anything all my life until I was 48 years of age. So I didn't understand speech. I didn't understand vowels, consonants. So I went through high school, college, my MBA, without any knowledge of words. Now try to think about that. I had no, no means of understanding anything. I had to figure out what people were saying. I had no accommodation. So when you take a six month old 
that has no concept of what noise, sounds, you know, anything. And you put a little device in that goes to the brain because they can't hear through their no their ears. The device goes through their brain and introduces a tone. And their brain is growing all the time. So it's learning through a new way of hearing. And then they turn it on at increments of time. And their brain, because it's growing, you know, they're always, you know, they're learning how to sit up and recognize things, you know, and, and their growth spurts is so high. They've learned over now the last two years what they can give them in increments of time to, to help them with their eyes, with their ears, with their taste. They know how much to give them to, to understand how to not only see, but to hear, to taste, to move, you know, and, you know, it's remarkable, you know, and they, they did that because they had already been doing one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, because they, the parents were exasperated, you know, they, they didn't like their kids not being able to interact, you know, because, you know, they were, they were there in their cribs or they were there in their surroundings and they didn't know what was happening. You know, they weren't responding. And when you have grandparents, kids and parents that are, have a nondescript child, you know, I, I was oblivious to anything around me. My sister, you know, I was bullied all my life. My sister took care of things because I had people, you know, picking on me all the time. But I was oblivious to it. I didn't know, you know, what people were doing in me because I never heard it. Well, thank you. Know, the child, the child had had this has this given to them, and when they have the, you know, the sun uh, learning curve. It helps their brain learn about that noise and respond to the stimulus that are given to it. And this is how the studies go. I don't, I don't have, you know, um, statistics, you know, at, at hand, but I do know that from what, what I've read that if kids are implanted, kids with severe, you know, hearing loss at birth, are implanted at a very early age and six months is about right. Um, they generally, whenever there are some follow-up studies that seem to indicate, Rohimi, you can correct me if I'm wrong, which basically indicate that they develop their language skills that pretty much at normal. what normally yes. hearing kids develop. Yes. And that I think is the criterion. Yes. I wonder whether we could you know, change the subject you know, a little bit because one thing we have, we haven't talked a little bit about, about we haven't talked much about older uh, kids. And I think at some point, you know, it might, it's, it sounds, it's useful to maybe talk about what can we do or what could be done because my sense is that we're not doing an awful lot to get kids to advocate for themselves. I mean, at some point they're gonna grow up. They're not gonna have parents around, you know, to direct, they're not gonna yada, yada, yada you know, to help them. Um, but they're going to need to step up. They, I mean, they, they're either, they withdraw and, and suffer, every, you know, every the depression and whatever, um, or they advocate for themselves. And I, I know that kids are reluctant to do that because then they have to acknowledge that they've got a problem which may subject them to teasing. Um, and but that does stri strikes me as something that they're going to have to do, and the earlier they do it, the better. Yeah, in that, I would uh, the best way to you know self advocate for uh, these younger ad adults is to advocate for others. You know what you can do for others, just forming a club. You know support groups would you know when they know that there are other people like them at their in their age groups having the same problems that would get them to open up for one and also do something for the whole group as you know just even they're in school they can you know there are so many clubs uh they can start a club for people who are hearing impaired you know so um that could be also have uh, you know uh, a fun uh, 
uh, thing in uh, added to it. It does doesn't have to be all dreary, all like you know, uh, just looking at only challenges. You know, that's one big part. But also, um, how to come out of it. You know, you can just uh, people uh, each hearing impaired. That's one thing. Each one has their unique experiences. You know, one hearing person's uh, you know experience because of the hearing loss cannot be matched with others. So they all can come together, talk about it. Um, you know, form a club, do something for the community. And I, I think instead of just doing for themselves, when they start thinking about others, they kind of become comfortable sharing about their own uh, problems. Um, it's more of a support group or together would be uh, probably, I know where you're coming from. They're, they're very, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, treading on eggshells. They don't want to share too much. They're at that age. They 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 are very private. They don't want to talk about their challenges. I I see that. You know, one thing is they should they do they should get a lot. Of, having a, a school counselor or psychologist doesn't mean that these kids will go to them to share the problems. So why I'm saying is peer to peer group would help is that. I, I don't know what stops them in going to an adult sharing the problem. They are more, e uh, for them, it's more easier to open up and talk about their problems with their peers. So we have to exploit that and help them, you know, form a support group or, you know, work towards a cause, uh, a, a community group or a group in a school, you know, a club in the school and have fun activities. So, you know, it will help them not only just for their mental health, but also, uh, you know, give them the confidence uh, that, you know, increase, boost their self-esteem. And they know that, you know, they have that self-worth to go out in that new world with the challenges, you know, more bigger challenges than they have in school. School still, they are protected. You know, they have all these services, even if they want, they can go to a counselor, psychologist, but when they are out on their own, there's nothing much, but then they, they know now have the right tools to go. They're going for higher education. They're going to colleges and uni universities. They can start a club there. They can amass support group. They can bring like people who have patch, uh, you know, share the same uh, similar challenges because they are hearing impaired and uh, work towards, you know, whatever they, I mean, talk about it or, you know, do things together. Um, at least have the right tools when they go out in the world. So I, I feel that, you know, getting peer support is more of a uh, answer to this than, you know, for them to keep encouraging them to go to an adult, which is all, you know, it has its advantages, but I think the, uh, the young adults would be very comfortable in, uh, and they understand, understand. Uh, that's what I, I, when I wrote my second article about how to reach lots of college students, um, that, some studies say that, yeah, we know that, you know, we have to wear hearing protection devices. Yeah, when we go to the new concert, but you know what, we don't, we, you know, doesn't look cool. You know, my friends don't like it when I wear it. So there's peer pressure. They, there's there's a, this kind of a cult thing going on amongst them, you know, that's, that stops them from using the knowledge. You know, they, they're okay to lose their hearing, but not wear hearing protection. You know, they say, I'm okay to wear hearing protection. There's one cool study that I've mentioned there. They say that these are college students. They say, I, I wear hearing protect. I wear my earbuds um, when I'm doing lawn mowing, when I'm doing shooting uh, rifles, but I don't wear, I don't like to wear HPDs when I go to a musical concert or sporting activities because it's look, looked down upon by my friends. So, these are the things an adult would not understand. You know, we'll just say, you know it, it's so healthy your parents or uh, any health professional, you know it's not safe. Why don't you wear it? They just won't say those things that, you know, there is a there is a silent uh, language that's going on among the um, among these younger adults, which, you know, so to to in order to break into it, either we understand their language and what's going on with them psychologically, or let them get together and find a solution for them problem that you're facing. Ken? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I just wanted to follow up and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here and try to connect some dots. And I asked about statistics earlier and Russ you you 
you brought up the issue of you know the, these these young adults are going to have to go out in the real world and take care of themselves they're without their parents and hearing loss or not that is that is the case with every young adult right. but i want to i want to make an argument of why it's it's so important to address this early on and i think this was this was talked about it's the brain plasticity and the when they're using cochlear implants what is incredibly important is education for all all children and being able to succeed there's research not that doesn't nothing needs to be said about that but it is critically important in those very young years, six months, that's when the brain learns the most. And if they do not have the ability for speech and hearing noises and developing speech, the research shows that that ability to develop language there's a direct connection of being able to learn. And so at that young age, giving them the ability to hear, develop that language, it helps them tremendously in their ability to learn throughout their lives and hopefully to be more successful. Real quick, there's an economist University of Chicago, Nobel Prize winning, that is, is doing studies. Uh, James Heckman has a Heckman, it's called the Heckman curve, that he argues that the best time to invest in a person is to get their best return on the investment is at the very young age. So cochlear implants, at a very young age, if you can get the parents to support that, not even implants, but just the support, actively getting involved with the hearing health care of their child is the best time to make that investment. Well, that, that's a very good point. But the problem right now, I mean, in, 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 in the older adults that when they were, there is a lot that they have to process when, you know, it's okay. There's one set of people, uh, kids, uh, children who have hearing aids throughout from the young age, they go into uh, uh, high school and then when they come out, they face a different kind of problems. It's not... Uh, it's not just, it's not in their control, it's also other external factors now. They, they face discrimination, as I mentioned, the employability, you know. Uh, they, they, they are now seeing, okay, you're not going to be picked for this job because you are hearing impaired, or you're not going to be paid equally because you're hearing impaired, or you are not going to get to that, you know, higher education that you wanted because you're hearing impaired. So you are not able to have that social relationship with who, whatever kind of uh, you know uh, family or what, like a normal person starts. You know you are going to be challenged even in that area. So all these new challenges is going to come there, and it's even whatever self esteem or self worth the child has. You know. Uh, a master over the years when the child was a, 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 a kid is now all grown. It's all gone. It's because it's entirely new challenges. The child has to relearn everything because it's it. He the child won't even have thought. Okay, I'm not going to be hired because I'm hearing impaired. You know. It's something new now his self but uh, a, a young adult having hearing aids they're going to be perceived just just by look they're going to be perceived they're going to be discriminated just because they're having these two devices hanging around the head or you know um so because 
just because uh, you know the the challenges where the older the elderly wearing hearing aids and the challenges that young adults wearing hearing aids two different things two different worlds and the stigma attached to old elderly wearing hearing aids and stigma attached to younger adults wearing hearing aids totally to you cannot generalize it so every uh, stage of their life these these children they have to learn relearn over again okay this is a new set of challenges now now i need to change my mindset for this one is they have to equip themselves with education and what kind again i said what kind of rights i can go and ask my employer that you know what i need um uh, uh telephone with uh you know caption on or like there are certain things that you know you need to know so that you can ask for that so you have to educate yourself second you need still need maybe a lot more um mental health support when they get to this stage so it's it's always there you never come out of it because the challenges are going to be new when they go to different stages of life so that is when they have to be aware that IDEA su supports these kind of people in the transition stage too, but most of the children, they think, okay, fine, schooling is done, now I'm out on my own, and they try to, again, find their way all by themselves, but they need not do that. There are resources out there, there are support services out there to help them through this transition period, but not many know of them. So again, you know, the power is education. They have to self-advocate themselves, find out what is there this step that can help myself. And again, um, they have to, you know, the Google organization like yours is beautiful uh, resources, toolkits, go in, read up, find out, okay, these are the things I, you, there, if you're going for higher education, you have support services for that. If you're going for, uh, you know, an employment, human resources, you can go and say, okay, look at this. These are the things I need these things. Yes. So if you don't ask, you don't, you won't get it. But what do you ask? That you need to learn by yourself. And I, we live in the uh, era of information rich era. You know, everything is out there. So all you have to do is just find out how you can help yourself. I think self-advocacy, when Russell mentioned that, you know, that self-advocacy should be one part of the presentation, I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled because at all, you know, from newborn where the parents, uh, you know, help the child. And then as you go, as young as preschoolers, you know, there's some places where self-advocacy for hearing impaired are ta taught. You know, it, it can be taught, it can be taught, but just that the self-advocacy skills just changes as you go on. Um, I think that's the train we have to hold on to, um, you know, at whatever stage you are and ask, know about it and ask the right questions. You will be, you know, uh, told what the, the resources will tell you what to do. Thank you. Other Questions, concerns, comments, and such. <laughs> I, I actually, I have a question. Um, speaking of education, I guess. So I don't remember, and I went to I went to high school and middle school a long time ago. So maybe things have changed, but. I don't remember any mention of hearing loss or um, noise exposure, the dangers of noise exposure in, in school. And so when I got diagnosed with hearing loss in college, I was completely shocked and I had never even thought about hearing loss before. So I'm wondering because noise exposure is something that's modifiable. It's something to me that's like the simplest thing that we can you know, if we're looking for ways to prevent hearing loss, mm -hmm. we know that noise causes hearing loss. It's something we can educate um, starting as early as elementary school. Yes. Kids about the dangers. Uh, I know that Noisy Planet already has all these great resources. And I don't know if it would have changed my behavior, but it might have, you know, I went to so many rock concerts. I listened to music 
so loud in my car that my car would be vibrating. I mean, I don't know if that caused my hearing loss, but it certainly didn't help. And I'm just wondering why, and maybe it is now taught in schools, but it just seems like a simple thing to be added to like a health class curriculum where they teach yes. about drugs and you know nutrition, everything. And so why isn't this, and it would also maybe help that stigma you talked about if someone wants to wear hearing protection, um, if there is just a greater awareness of how valuable that hearing protection is and the how de how debilitating hearing loss can be and that it does affect younger people i mean all these things are just so easy to to add to a curriculum and i feel like they could make a, a difference so i'm just wondering why yes you know. that that's that's really you hit the nail on the right place it's so it noise in your hearing loss is so preventable but you know, but there is progress being made. It's slow, but there is there are some. You know, I I, I see I in my kid uh, my, with my kids' school they do in health classes they do talk about uh, you know noise dangers of noise and all that. But again, the the awareness and the education it's very it's there. It's not zero. It's there. People are becoming aware of it. Um, again, like, you know, I talked about how it just doesn't resonate with our children, the, the materials that they have. Even Noisy Planet did a huge study. Like, why? Why is it not doing anything with the younger population? You know, they're just uh, really frustrated. And they found out that, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, they had made this material for the whole age, across the ages. And, you know, the, it's, again, they it didn't make any difference to younger people because it was boring. It was, uh, I don't know what they're talking about. So it's something that, you know, you have to talk their language when you have to make sense with these children, you know, make it fun, make it interactive. I, in my article, I just said like, you know, it make them, you know, measure with sound level. You have now in iPhones and Androids sound level meters, you know, you can use that, you know, make it fun exercise for them to measure the sounds in the music hall and then in lunch room and, you know, do something where they get the hand, uh, some, you know, just interactive so that it, it makes sense to them. Um, second uh, challenge we have is, again, in these people, there are a lot, there's some study that show that they know it, but they won't do it. They won't do it for so many reasons. So, some ways to reach them is I was just try to make it cool, you know, get these influencers, get these rock, uh, you know, artists uh, who was popular right now, make them wear it, you know, make them the coolest thing, you know, wear, uh, wearing hearing protection devices, the cool thing to do, get, give, you know, these um, uh, hearing protection devices, you know, the, uh, really just wearing and uh, the store-bought ones would be as effective as not wearing anything at all. So if there is a music concert, uh, keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, HP uh, earplugs in the vending machines so they can just, you know, or offer them for free. Just make it just cool so that, you know, the kids want to do it. You have to try different ways because, it is one hearing loss. We know it's preventable. You know, you can just not, if you can. And the sad part is if it happens, it's irreversible. It's preventable, but it's irreversible. It happens and there's no going back. I had this patient just 19 years old. And that was, that, that incident made me want to do this. You know, made me want to start this awareness thing, writing about it, is that she, she came with a hearing loss and she, and at first the ringing sound and then the, uh, it's not even hearing loss. They feel like it's muffled. They don't know how to say it. So they think it's something that will go away. They still keep repeating the, uh, you know, hearing habits that they have, which is very, very dangerous. And then ultimately they know, okay, now something is really off. I'm not hearing my classroom lectures. So they come and only thing, that caused her hearing loss was she was standing way too close to the loudspeaker in a concert. If she had just stepped away, just a 
probably a few feet, she wouldn't have had it. So just some signs, you know, some, you know, neon signs in the music concert that this is really loud. You need to be like four or five feet away from a loudspeaker would have just, you know, um, put her out of all those miseries. She was, it, and the sad part is she came for a follow-up probably for something else. And she did a follow-up for hearing test too. She said it never came back to normal. She, it's still muffled. She gets those uh, ringing sounds often and it's so annoying. But, you know, she said, if only I had known that one particular information to just stand away from the loudspeaker would have just made everything so good. So, yeah, that that was, you know, that's, that is really sad. If only I and, knew then what I know now. Yeah, that is sad. Let me ask you, you know, something in it. it Maybe things are getting better in some ways. At least I hope so. Um, with with yeah, yes, kids obviously are and, and adults for that matter. But kids, you know, I think more even more so than adults, don't want to be unusual. Don't want to stand out. The thing that strikes me is these days, everybody has something in their ears. Um, you know, and, and in many respects, I mean, okay, I've got a CI in one ear, I have a hearing aid in another, you got to be pretty close to me and have an idea that that's something other than, you know, something that somebody else is sticking in their ears. And so I'm wondering whether, you know, your sense is that the problem of, uh, of stigma and for, and for kids and young adults, the the, the the fear of stigma, the fear of standing out, and whether that's dim diminished in any sense. Do you get any sense of that? The problem that they are having something in their ears so often is itself a cause for noise in these hearing loss now. <laughs> so the, use, the, the noise so is so much into your ear canal that it's outside so that you're, you're going to get even more hearing loss because you're going to, okay, that's one side of it. Um, the thing is, they are wearing something in the ears the way you mentioned for for you know it's pleasure okay they they going to they are having fun with it but when you ask them to wear a earplug in a music concert or sports activity it's 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 not going to give them the same experience without it so there is a study where the the the, the students the college students report that we are ready to you know, sacrifice a hearing, but we, it is some, it's something like the, the, the now effect. Right now, I want to enjoy this thing uh, with its whole, you know, uh, not having a earplug. I'm not going to be bothered about what's going to happen, what's to come, but right now is important for me. So that is one thing they've seen in the study is that, uh, I forget the name, what they call it, some now something so they are they are ready to sacrifice their hearing but they're not ready to sacrifice the experience i see so probably what i said for that is they need to hear uh a way how a uh, noise induced hearing loss would sound to them when it happens you know the same concert if you play them and say, this is what's going to be happening to you in, in, in you know, if you maintain this uh, hearing uh, uh, practices in within probably six months to one year, all concert for entirety of your life is going to sound like this. And put them some, you know, MP3, some, some player in their ears and make them go around the campus with a ringing sound, ringing in their ears 24 by seven and tell them that, this is how it's going to feel if you're not going to protect your hearing now. You're going to end up with hearing this annoying sound forever in your. So they need to be uh, kind of they need to experience what ha what would happen. Uh, maybe that would change their behavior. You know, something that uh, these people want to experience. They don't want to be said this is got this. If you do this, this is going to happen. They wouldn't buy that. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, probably. I don't know. Uh... We are approaching the witching hour. Um, <laughs> is there a, a, a short question we can? Uh, I don't want to cut this off prematurely if there are good questions. 
or if there are questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't hear, maybe I have a hearing de defect, I'm <laughs> sure I do, of course. Um, Rohima, thank you very much. I found this You're very, welcome. very useful. Uh, Natalie, as always, thank you so much for the captions and thank everyone for coming. I hope you found this as useful as I know I certainly did. We will in the course of the next uh, days or a week, be a little bit patient. We will get out you know, a transcript. We will get out the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Rohima. Thank you. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Sorry? Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. And then we will also get out, I hope, you know, a, uh, a video. So uh, in the, as I say, in the course of the next days or a week. And thank you, everyone. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Thanks very much. You too. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you all.